This is Chair. I'm your host Nemanja. And let's first go back to previous week episode with Udo Eichinger from Siemens Serbia. I think you are you are not a natural born leader. I think through expertise that you have from your business point, from your studies or from your your business you went through, you're taking away some elements out of that. Additionally, you need to be, from my point of view, a good listener. You need to listen to people. You have to have empathy for people in order to understand their needs and their demands, right? Uh, companies who send people somewhere in a different uh, cultural environment Name it. Is it Asia? Is it Asia Pacific? Or is it uh, Far East or, or or Middle East? Or is it uh, Central Eastern Europe? Uh, needs to know that uh, you have to prepare your people for that cultural environment. You have to have, uh, let's say, uh, a kind of open mindset for a change, right? So if you are not open for a change, you would possibly not even changing a country. You would stay in secure Germany. You would, you would not uh, be willing to move your your with your with your pack of family from one place to another, putting them into uncertainty. So I think you need a kind of uh, a basic a basic willingness of change. This is chair place where we discuss innovations. What is esports? Apart from being a very competitive um, world of video gaming, is increasingly becoming the industry itself. Recently, hit one billion dollar market revenue. Our guest today is a key innovator in esports. It's my pleasure to introduce Sebastian Heflamok Liger, uh, transitioning from a commentator, organizer, and business executive to entrepreneur. He has explored every corner of this blooming young industry. So, Sebastian, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Likewise, nice to be here. Uh, so, esports achieved this billion-dollar uh, uh, industry uh, uh, definition, and uh, but this uh, must be more than a job for you. I w- I'd really like to know what it's gaming for you. Uh, gaming for me is uh, is something that, of course, I did as a child. Um, that's how it started. Um, I was very early exposed to PCs thanks to my uncle. He was like. Uh, today we call it nerd. Back then it was just someone that was interested in new technology, uh, like the first Intel PCs that came to Germany back then, East Germany above all. So it was not a normal thing to have. Um, and of course, he used it for his work and everything else. But as as with almost all technical devices, there were games on it. So and I started to play and, and we kids, we watched how the adults did their thing and whatnot. And sometimes we were allowed. So for me, this was a, a bit like Christmas. And then, of course, as the years move forward, deeper into the 90s, you know, handheld devices became a thing. Nintendo Game Boy, which was more loved than a plush animal for me, right? Other kids had some other toys. I had my Nintendo. I had it everywhere. That's pretty much how it started. And from there on, I had always my own PC, my own device. And uh, um, yeah, that's pretty much how I grew up. I did everything on a PC, my schoolwork, and then, of course, gaming. And that's, that's why it's so dear to me. Uh, over over the years, it, it's it's a companion to me that never left me in any form or way. And your career path, it's pretty interesting because uh, you at the beginning you loved the gaming, and then you moved to some completely new direction. Can you yeah. give me some story behind that? I mean, let's 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 face it, esports as, as such as an industry where you can go or even study these days uh, and then have a career and then get paid a proper salary is an industry that's that's younger than ten years old. In the 2010s, it really bloomed. Before that, we also had esports. I was playing competitive Counter Strike and Quake and Unreal already in, in 1999, attending LAN parties. But we did this A for fun, and our prize pools were like maybe a mouse or a keyboard, and that was something amazing, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, today, people they, they would laugh about it. So a viable career path really is 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 just a recent years topic. And and before that, I'm I'm, I'm German. Uh, I'm coming from an academic family, so I did what I was supposed to do, what my family expected me to do, which means graduate at a, at a good school, uh, go study. First, I thought I'm going to change the world with politics. So I studied politics, uh, history, and psychology. Um, I hated the guts out of this, uh, uh, mostly because of the professors. Um, <laughs> How long you stay there? Um, I studied for three years there. 
Um, but as I said, we really had bad professors. I was at a technical university, so we were sort of the, the prodigal faculty anyway. Um, and, and we didn't get support from the professor. So it felt really, you felt useless uh, in, in what you study. Later, I found out actually that if I would have graduated, there was a high demand in, in for example, political scientists. Um, and I'm still very political today uh, on the side, but that's not a topic. And then, then I was like, okay, what are I going to do with my life? I'm coming from medical family. So I studied medicine because I knew it's, there's always a supply. People <laughs> always get sick, no matter where in the, in the, in the world. Um, and I knew exactly what I'm doing because I've been working emergency service as a paramedic before and, and, and whatnot. So yeah, that was my second choice. Little did I know that the life will have a third option for me. And uh, that came almost in my last year of med school. And all of a sudden, all the things I did on the side, the little projects and companies I built over the years, I had my little production company. I was in a Dota 2 commentator. Um, I did it even podcasts like we, we talked already before the podcast about so this it this is not new to you this is not new uh, i was the host actually so i did all these things and and then as esports grew people were looking for people with experience but it was really hard to find an industry that until this point didn't make any money so the people that had experience were the people that are uh, players coaches oh, actually we didn't have much coaches back then but people that were as a as a hobby involved that was the only way you got ex experience. You had to bleed into it, right? With your time, your money and everything. Nobody really made big money back then. And that's pretty much how it started. And then the offers piled up every year. I got better offers and whatnot until that one day uh, where a big company came to me with a super ambitious uh, project and, and with a franchise, which was very known in esports. And I just couldn't say no. And that's when I started uh, really full time, not just on the side, not just in the night, and, and, and ever since, I'm, I'm in esports. And the only reason I'm now an entrepreneur is because I hated my CEO. And I, I didn't understand why can I not just do this myself? Why do I have there to listen so to this guy? Saying, <laughs> saying something like this, that why they got to... I mean, I didn't hate him on a personal level. I have to make that clear. He, he was a, 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 a good guy. Uh, rest in, in, in peace. He died from Corona, actually, this year. But... Uh, um, he was just slow. In my head, he was slow. I had all these good ideas. I wanted to bring things forward and whatnot. But since I was in the food chain, just the third or fourth guy, I always had to wait. What does the COO say? What, when is he in the office? He's always business traveling and everything, right? And I didn't feel I was heard. And I was at the end, why am I not doing this myself? And that's, after, that's why after two years, I just said, like, I'm not going to work for anyone anymore. I can do exactly this myself, in my opinion, even better than my CEO, for example. So this is bringing us to 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 main subject of today, and uh, we are always talking here about innovations. And I want to ask you about uh, uh, 2G Hub and what uh, has compelled you to create it. Yeah, um, 2G Hub is as I said when I, when I founded the company, I, and I've seen so much of of esports. The question for me was always how do I solve uh, uh, problems in the industry? Um, naturally, I uh, I don't like B two B for for one reason. Um, because it's not scalable. It's like a law firm. You can only have as many clients as you have lawyers and paralegals and associates, but you can't dilute yourself down. Nobody sees you as the prime law firm anymore when you have like 500 lawyers, right? They, they see you as a mass factory. Yeah. And you can apply that to, to a creative agency or, or anything else, right? So B2B was always for me just a funnel to get into it. And I wanted to store value, data, anything that grows and scales up over time. So even your company grows by w just doing what you're doing. Um, that was reason number one. And then reason number two, 2G Hub, the original idea was, it, for those that don't understand it, <laughs> the idea was to sort of merge a social platform like Facebook or, or, or similar with a tournament platform, which you need to do all the events and, and tournaments. And then the third part was uh, aggregation. So everybody knows aggregation in, in any other industry. You go to booking.com, Google Flights, when you want to travel, this is a normal thing. But for those that are a bit older, like, for example, you and me, you remember that we used to look up things in the yellow pages or that we had to uh, go to a travel agency or call uh, hotels or anything like that. I know it sounds totally outlandish to, to, to the younger people, but there were no aggregators. So and for me, the logic is very simple. Every industry that grows to a certain point um, the entropy, like the chaos, gets so high that you need to aggregate. And that's what I wanted to tackle with Tucci Hub. The only thing that happened over time, and that's why innovation is always key, is 
I realized very quickly that as a European venture aiming for a big B2C project, you need massive amounts of funding. And funding doesn't come for free. I'm not talking money. I'm talking about all the other strings attached. Obligations to... Obligations uh, uh, to shareholders, shareholders inserting their often wrong opinion. There are many investors that forget that they give the money because they believe in someone and they know their industry. But then they project their other external experience and logic uh, to something they don't understand. And that's why also many companies fail after investment. So long story short, the reason we, we went from original the big B2C idea to then a gradual B2C with a heavier B2B angle right now, what we do today, is because we wanted to do it without investors. That's the, the super short story and reasoning behind how this all came to be. I wanted to solve this, this problem and I still believe that 2 Up is going to be a big platform in the years to come. Just how we build it has changed. Slower, more organic, without some dark voice in the back of my head telling me I should do things, even though I know much better how we should do it. And can you share me, uh, with me some insights how platform actually work? Um, okay, so, so I mean, the, the, the social part, as I said, we, 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 we took sort of the best from all the social frameworks, right? So befriending people, chatting with people, uh, sharing interests and whatnot. And, and there we're, we're also innovating more um, in, in, in the sense of engagement these days, Everybody is effectively an influencer. Um, if you have a name and access to internet, you're an influencer, even a micro one. Um, and, and people want to monetize it. Obviously, most of the monetization funnels, for example, are in the hands of big companies. And they only give you a tiny portion of what they actually make. Every dollar they make on you, you get maybe a cent on it, maybe 10 cents in, in, in good uh, cases. So engaging, building better communities, uh, uh, discovering new revenue sources. This is one of our next goals when it comes to influencers. So that's one thing. That's the social component, building teams, building communities, chatting with each other, finding people of interest. Uh, we have functions that, you know, you can filter, for example, by find people that like the same game, find people in the same city, find, uh, in theory, you can filter by age, let's say someone 30 years old, blonde hair into World of Warcraft, if that's your thing, right? And then you, <laughs> so you can even use it for dating purposes if you really want to, right? So that's the social component. Tournament engine, I said, you need to do uh, tournaments, right? That's what competitive gaming is all about. And, and we have one of the best tournament engines in the world. Um, so that's sort of a basic tool. It's a must have. It's like tires on a car. You can have a Ferrari. If you don't have tires, it's not going anywhere, right? So that's really a it's basic not thing. It's Ferrari. It's just like yeah. an expensive uh, piece of furniture, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and then, as I said, the, the, the last part is, is about data. I love to aggregate data. Uh, in, in, in fact, in another life, I would just start a company purely based on getting data in one place. Uh, because, as I said, I grew up with yellow pages, no internet and everything. So I knew how it was before. And now I can open three tabs on my browser and I have half the world pretty much condensed in, in one place. And I love that. Uh, that's why I'm a big, big fan of uh, Google, for example. So you can think about Google, whatever you want, but bringing one thing, uh, all the things in one place, Google is probably one of the best companies for that, right? Not just search engine, but everything around it. So, and I wanted to do this for esports. We aggregate tournaments, uh, locations, And now we, we launched last year our, our uh, news aggregator as well. Um, actually, for business people like you, you don't have the time to go through like, what, 30, 40, 50 different news outlets and, and find out what esports is. Not to mention that these paid journalists, they write long articles. And you don't have time for that. Especially millennials generation said the younger generation, they don't have time to that. They, they stop reading after the headline, maybe three more lines. So we actually build a news aggregator that takes the news from all places together, um, headline, short description, sources, maybe some quotes from, for example, Twitters. Sometimes we work opinions in, but we don't give the opinion. We're fully agnostic. We just report what the internet says about it. And then you have the choice. Either you go next or you say like, oh, I want to know more about this. And then you click on the source. And then you go to this five-page article, I don't know, in the Washington Post or in the yeah. Useful Observer, right? So we build... Uh, things like this. And I have a few more things in the pipeline where we want to aggregate things. But it's a matter of, of, of money. We don't monetize these things. It's really just a service to the industry. Um, we, we make our money, as I said, more on the B2B side uh, until the point where B2C grows. That's mm -hmm. what happens without investors. Yeah. Uh, uh, I will come to that later. I want to ask you what's, what's next for the platform as well and what, yeah. what's the next innovation. But before that, you mentioned earlier basically that companies are exploiting their users. Uh, what are the alternatives? 
Yeah, that's, 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 that's a big problem. I mean, wh why do they do this? Most of these companies, they started doing something good, right? It was a great idea uh, um, to begin with. And uh, what happened later? These companies grew. Many of them went public. The original founders are gone. Uh, people from other industries come in as executives and they, they well, <laughs> they're under the fist of, of shareholders. If you're publicly listed, everybody expects their dividends and whatnot. So um, these companies are not so sharky on data and everything because they want to. It's not just, oh God, we need more data and everything. It's just because, yeah, every year they need to do a, a bit more. And I think they get also a bit lost in, in, in their mission. Uh, alternatives, yes, but the alternatives always less money. So the, the reason Facebook is such a hated company today <laughs> is, is simply because they, they lost their, their, their mission. The original idea was connect people between universities. That was literally it. They and, and, from and, there and today's, and, and today's mission is like, I want to know everything about you because I, I still believe there is half a cent somewhere to be made because I know which color your socks are. And, and that's really, that was not the original mission. Even though Zuckerberg is still at, at the helm with many companies after such a long time, the original founder is not there anymore. Maybe he is some glorified chairman, but not actually in an executive role. But there's many other examples. So what's the alternative is uh, don't go public. <laughs> That's one. <laughs> uh, the other alternative is, is that other revenue sources or make it very clear that, that your... Um, that your company is, is, is not after this. And then maybe also protect it with technology. I mean, I'm not a big blockchain person in the sense of, you know, forcing blockchain on everything, but there are some cool technologies where you can even prevent yourself from the temptation to go deeper. So if you build, for example, data on, on, on ledger systems, even you as a company, you can't touch it. So there are good things you can, it's like with the cookie jar, right? You hide it from yourself. Or you put a time yeah. device on it so you cannot go for more than one cookie a day because that's what your diet tells you. So there's a few cool things. And of course, it's company culture. Like don't have the company be massively replaced by other externals in the, in the search of new revenues and profits. Just keep a good core and yeah, align with, with your team that let's not be those guys. But other than that, there is no real alternative. In a capitalistic system, you will always try to exploit to the absolute maximum until it crashes. Yeah. That's just how capitalism works. <laughs> so uh, let's go back to platform. And uh, can you share with me some uh, things that you are working right now and the things that yeah. you want to work in the future? Important to know is that, as I said, uh, um, being without investors, what we did is um, all the, the, the money we put into the platform with the original B2C mission was... That I, that I said to myself, why don't we share this with others, right? And that got us into SaaS, IP cell, um, and, and, and uh, customizing for clients, right? Because many people, they don't want to be on someone else's platform. They want to have a bit of me in there, right? They want to say, this is my URL, my design. It feels, smells, touches like, uh, uh, like it's my own. And that's when we started using our engine and, and, and the things we had uh, building for other clients. And that, that goes really, really well. Um, and my innovation part there is not just the technology, but it's also to have business models that are very compliant with esports. As I said, esports is an under-monetized, very young industry, which means, I don't know, if, 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 you, if you ask an IBM or a Siemens guy how much they charge for their enterprise services, SaaS or anything like that, we're talking about six, seven figures, right? In esports, you have to provide things for free and four figures. Uh, in, in some cases. So we build everything from little grassroots solution, let's say a high school that doesn't have much money, but also up to big telcos everywhere in Asia and in the Middle East and Europe. Um, and most of, the, most of the businesses are not flexible. And one of our missions is to always stay flexible. I don't want to build a one size fits all kind of thing. Um, so yeah, we build really for grassroots as well as for, for, for the big names out there. But it's, it's, it's difficult, right? Because... On the one hand, you don't, you don't want to be that static. On the other hand, clients expect you to be static. They, they expect to have a call with you. And after that call, you send the deck through with sort of option A, B, C and three different sizes. If you give them too much freedom, they're, especially co uh, corporate entities, their brains explode and they, they don't work with you because it feels too complex. It feels too much freedom. They're not used to freedom. They're used yeah, to... They're used to like yeah. putting me like in the exactly. specific 
part, yeah. Yeah, they're like business development managers or acquisition managers, what what not. And they go out there, they have chats with people, and then they expect like free options. And then they choose. And they go back to their board, get the green light, and that's it. And and when, when I'm coming to them and say like, look, we can make it really just like it's your own. You know, people don't even need, need to know I build it. Um, they're confused by this. So the corporate world and the esports world is, is clashing in, in, in that sense as well, on top of us having to explain what esports is. So long story short, we innovate on, on, on this. As I said, we, we build engagement technology, something around uh, integrating better with the, with the games. The aggregation I mentioned in the beginning, I want to build a few more of those. And um, that's pretty much it. That's, that's our B2C side. Um, we, we also want to take our chat out to, let's call it like a WhatsApp for gamers. So effectively, Sounds what you know from yeah. Telegram, Signal, WhatsApp, uh, Viber, and so on, but with a, with a twist towards uh, uh, gaming. So there's a few projects we have in the pipeline, um, but we're still a startup, which means priorities and, and pipelines shift. Yeah, that was my question. How you how you define priorities? How you, uh, how you decide where to go next and what to do next? Well, the number one decision is always money. <laughs> <laughs> so um, wh- whatever pays the best, uh, on, on the B2C side, you have to go for it, right? Um, of course, sometimes you, you take a hit on the money for something that's strategic. It gives you users, it opens you other doors and everything. So that would be my second priority decision. And if, if the decision is, I don't know, sort of 50-50, then I would go with the most innovative uh, thing to do. Um, so when, when, when you're a young company and you go into something as old as the internet by now, there's two ways of building things. Either you innovate by looking at all the other products and you take the best of everything in hopes that you build something better with the best of all, the above average of all kind of thing, or you try to disrupt entirely. Like you try to go for something that nobody has ever seen before, but then you also run the risk that your users are like, oh my God, I'm not comfortable with this one. Uh, I've never seen it. It it feels weird. Um, So, and you have to walk a very fine line with it. So, when I'm, I'm also the product owner, apparently, in my company. Of, uh, I'm trying to hire product owners, but it's hard to find in the e- esports. Um, but I'm doing all the research, really, in, in, this, in the same way I just, I just said it. I, I, I look around, also outside the industry, what is there, what is the best. And that is sort of my baseline. And then I'm trying to find the magic sauce I can put on top, something someone has never, ever seen before, or that explores a new revenue source or anything like that. And that's pretty much how most of our new features are being built. So I want to go back to eSports uh, a bit like broader. And you mentioned earlier, it's a, it's a new thing. It's, uh, it's 10, 15 years old, actually. But now it's coming to an Olympics in 2024. Yeah. And it's so interesting. So uh, do you think that gamers will have to do more cardio for this? Uh, <laughs> let, let's let's start somewhere. I'll get back to the cardio, but let's start with with defining actually esports for for the 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 listeners and and viewers that might not understand. You you have gaming, right? And gaming is not just a billion dollar industry. It's 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 much bigger than that. It includes everything from your little mobile game, your browser game on your Facebook Messenger. It includes everything, right? From triple A down to casual. Um, and esports is. A super tiny fraction of that, really. But we're talking about. Um, I'm just throwing some numbers, but please don't don't hit me on the numbers if they're correct. But you have, let's say, 70, 80 percent of the games are non-competitive titles, right? That's just what you play in your free time, and that's it, right? Then you have 20 percent competitive titles, and competitive starts when you start ranking yourself. You play four scores, and you rank in a ladder, right? So you can be number one, number five, whatsoever. So that's mildly competitive. And then of course come game where you play against other players in real time or, or turn-based or whatsoever, and, and the competitive density gets gets higher. And the higher they are, the closer we get to esports. Now, what's the difference between a competitive game and esports? Very simple, uh, just like with sports. Like, uh, I don't know, some, some, some weird local sports uh, uh, that nobody ever heard of, that's a sport. But it doesn't make it like a, a, a big title, you know, in the Olympics or World Championships or anything like that. I mean, there's there's things like rolling cheese down the hill in, in Scotland or something yeah. like that. That's considered a sport, right? Do they do this in Finland or in Russia? Definitely not. So, and it's the same with, 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 with esports. So what happened is you have these, let's say, 20% competitive games. And out of that, probably 1% or so made it to the top. And they became a, an actual esports. And esports means you have a competitive title with a very active 
uh, community behind it, uh, broadcasting, merchandise, franchises, names, uh, uh, betting, uh, data business. So everything you can think of, right, from the entertainment and the sports business. And that effectively makes uh, esports. And esports in itself is pretty much the umbrella form of that one little 1% of the gaming industry. And then within esports, we're still dividing between regions because they're often very different how they operate. And we're dividing between the games. So Counter-Strike is totally different from, I don't know, for example, League of Legends. It's entirely different industries, different business model, different people doing it. Uh, the culture is different. The users are different. So when people say they know esports, they're mostly lying. They mostly know one part of esports, and then you have to realize they know effectively just 0.001% of the gaming industry. And that's what most people don't understand. There is no such a thing as esports experts. It's just people that have been for a long time in esports knowing a wide spectrum yeah. of things. Now, let's get to the, to the Olympics. One of the issues in esports we had is that we, we, we sought after recognition, right? When in 2004, I organized the LAN party and the local TV channel that nobody watches probably uh, came, I was like super excited, like, wow, a camera, a microphone, someone asking me questions, <laughs> woo, you know? Um, and then over the years, we were like, we measured ourselves a bit like child and parent, right? You have like a, a dad or a mom that's are super busy and you're trying to do things, good or negative sometimes, to get the attention, you know, that they're like, oh, good boy, you know, that was really good. I'm so proud of you. And we felt for many years like this, but for me, it shifted, especially in the 2010s, because it was like, we're grown up. We're, we're making our own money. We have our own business models. We found our own magic sauce. I don't need to, to get the approval from, from sports, from iGaming with casinos and, and betting giants and, and uh, 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 other things. And that's, that's pretty much one of the, the conundrums we have these days. There's still a good part of mostly new esports people that came recently to the industry. Recent means in the last three, four, five years. And they still believe that if Warner Music or Amazon or whatever is, is not in the loop, esports is not a real thing. It's just niche and small and everything. While us older guys uh, in esports, we're like, we're fine. So if Amazon wants to be involved in esports, they bought Twitch, for example, but let's say another example, I don't know, let's say Warner Music, if they want to be involved, um, then please go for it, right? There are sponsorships, activations, tech, you can invest, they can do anything, but not in a sense where we sell ourselves out. And now to the Olympics, um, the problem is actually TV and traditional sports, they need us. It's a fact. They're dying, okay? Yeah. Their users are getting older. Nobody's watching their stuff. Their formats haven't changed in sometimes decades. You know, the Olympics I watched as a child with my parents is still the Olympics uh, today if I would watch it, which I don't because it's boring. So um, that's their problem. They need to rejuvenate their audience. They need to innovate. They tried that in the past with, you know, getting new sports in there. I don't know if you remember, like, maybe 10 years back or 15 years back, it was cool when they brought snowboarding in the Winter yeah. Olympics, right? Because That's they their get the new generation and everything. Yeah? Exactly, right? So for, for they are not interested in esports. In fact, they hate us because we're, we're not compliant, we're, we're asymmetric users or we're, we're very digital and they're old and non-digital, right? They are linear TV and newspaper kind of logic. Um, so they actually don't like us but they need us. Now, here's my problem. There's people in esports that want the recognition from them. They would do everything, bend everything. They would work for free just so, please, please, Olympics takes us. Or please, football club, please, football league or whatever, please take us. But in reality, you just need to sit it out. You sit on the gold pot. They're running out of money. They need you. You know, you're not the next mining location. And, and we're not taking advantage of that. So the Olympics, for example... They come with their outside rules. They don't bother to understand esports. They, not the user, not the entrepreneurs and people behind it, not the business models, nothing. Not even the rules and the culture. So when they come, just we're the Olympics, we're like big and everything. Uh, even though for me, they're just nothing but a, a corrupt bunch of old people uh, making millions and billions of, of, of athletes often not making that money. Um, and then they come and project also their rules. So the Olympics, for example, they, they don't allow violent games which I find hilarious because they allowed shooting and judo and karate and everything where you literally punch someone in the face. But, oh, God forbid, there are some fantasy figures, I don't know, fighting each other. That's, for example, forbidden. So what they call esports is exactly against the definition I gave earlier in, in this segment. It's not esports. 
They allow things like e-sailing. So effectively a simulation for sailing. I mean, have, has anyone ever heard about that? It's, it's not even considered esports. Nobody in esports even knows there's an ele electronic version of, of sailing simulation. There's, I don't know, maybe a few thousand people in the world that even know that, let alone a, a competitive scene or commentating or anything like that. So they just pump up these things so they find something from our industry to, to put into the Olympics. So they sort of, I call it sports washing. They're sports washing us. So they ignore all the big successes. They ignore all the culture. And they just take a few little, little uh, things and, and paint it over and write esports on it. And that's what they put into Olympics. So I like the efforts where they do next to the Olympics sort of activations with esports, with real esports, the titles that are successful and everything. But what we're going to get now uh, in, in the next year in the Olympics uh, is, is not esports. That, that's just my outright opinion. And that's why I don't condone it. However, one last thing, I, I do see some positive in it. While we might, might not be happy with the results right now, they see it as innovation and everything, but it probably paves the way forward. Give it another 10 years, and I think they will break down these rules and idiotic title choices that they have. Um, but yeah, it, it will take time. I just don't like the, the, the sellout period that we're in right now. I think we could do much better. Um, again, they need us. We don't need them. Uh, you basically define yourself as a veteran of esports, uh, and with that said, can you share with me your vision of uh, what will esports in what will involve in the future? Yeah, uh, esports and gaming, right? Because here's the thing, right? Esports has this trickle down effect, uh, just like football, right? You have football, the top one percent, uh, the Champions League and the Premier League, Bundesliga and whatnot. But let's face it, that's just a few hundred footballers and all the millions behind it. If you go downwards second divisions and whatnot, all of a sudden all the money and the attention is gone. However, the kids still play football behind the house, right? So you have uh, uh, eSports, the top thing, and then the trickle-down effect. And that's all the people that are closer to games, um, play it casually, and, and, and also use it as a skill. So for me, the final vision is, is A, eSports becomes a lot more consolidated, uh, a lot more rules will apply, uh, governments will, will embrace it to a certain point, a lot more innovation will come uh, uh, in, 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 in the space. And I do believe we have an actual run against sport. We're not going to cannibalize each other, right? Uh, most people see it maybe as a threat that these new guys come and they take it away. Um, but I do believe we actually have a, a solid chance to be, um, you know, when, when I go on my, my Serbian TV channel, I have like, I don't know, 15, everything from golf and football and, and, and I don't know, UFC, MMA. And now, these days, okay. I have, for example, an eSports one, right? So and this will become a very normal uh, thing across all media and everything. What, what I also do believe is that the trickle-down effect of eSports, and it has nothing to do with eSports, but it's the trickle-down effect is that we're going to utilize gaming for many other things, such as education. So, for example, I learned English not in school. I learned English in games because I had to. There was no German localization of the game. I just had to learn it, right? Uh, and I, I had to go with a dictionary. Then later I was leading 40 and 50 man raids in, in World of Warcraft in English as a guy who was really just having school English and whatnot. The reason I speak English today as I do is because gaming, not because I'm, I'm in business today or anything like that. So uh, the, the ability to lead a team of 40 people, that's 40 active players and reservists, you would call them, like, guilt up to the, the size of 100 people. Organizing 100 people, that's why I'm not, not even getting a sweat when I organize my 20, 30 people in my company right now. I did this 10 years ago in games, and that's even more complicated. All remote, different characters, different cultures, and, and everything. So gaming teaches absolutely essential skills, and you see it across the world that the teachers started to use it. Why, why force people in, into, into books and boring topics when you can do it through games? or in a gamified way. So this is also the trickle-down effect, which is really cool. Gaming is an essential part of, of our lives, and, and this whole stigma that we had over all those years is going away. Today, if you ask someone, gaming, yeah, yeah, I have like three apps on my phone. It's the normal thing. In, in, in 2005, when I told someone, I'm gaming, I'm, I'm having a PC, you were still the nerd. You were the unwashed basement kid. So, and this is, we're talking only about 20 years. Now this thing gets traction. Imagine what we can do in the next 10 years. 
Hefelmock, thank you so much for this conversation. I enjoyed it. And for you out there, see you next Thursday when we talk about some new innovations. Thank you. Thank you very much.